Well, this big chap here he is Lester, or Red Lester to use his full title. And he is a red tailed buzzard, or red tailed hawk, depending on what part of the world you're from. And he is a typical buzzard in that he's got lovely big broad wings, he's got a fanned tail, and he does as little as possible. Now that's not to call him lazy, but it is to call him opportunistic. He is a survivalist in the wild. That is essentially what your buzzards are. Your falcons are your speed demons, your kestrels are your rodent and insect hunters. Vultures do most of the clean-up job in most of the world, but we don't have vultures in this country. And so, buzzards do the next best thing. They are essentially our clean-up crew. Now, I'm going to talk about buzzards and vultures at the same time, despite only having a buzzard here, because we don't have them in this country. But, buzzards are given a very, very bad reputation, and it's totally unfair, because they are depicted as a lazy bird. But they are not lazy, but they are just opportunistic. There's no point in him going up and soaring at a thousand foot every day when he could sit on the floor and eat mice. Because that's easy, it's not a waste of energy, it's a very sensible way of going out and living life. But, you know, they are sitting there for quite a lot of the time and he's obviously not particularly keen on the big roller coaster ride behind him because he's like, oh, I don't really want to come over there with that behind me. We'll fly over this way, shall we? So you can fly into it and you can watch it just in case it comes down and eats you. Luckily, we stopped it spinning because that would have been not very good fun for them. Come over here. Yeah, much better. So buzzards, they are really, really efficient birds at soaring. They're designed to use their big broad wings with their fingertips to go up catch the breeze, catch the heat, go around, around, around a couple of times and then come down on a rabbit or a squirrel or a rat or roadkill because there's nothing easier than catching a rabbit than a rabbit that's not running away from you. And so they will go after roadkill but that's not what they're all about. They are able to catch rabbits and they do, I've seen it myself. They can absolutely catch them, it's just not something they're going to do every single day. Now, I so said we'll talk about vultures as well because these guys do eat lots of carrion, they do eat lots of roadkill, and out in, say, India or Africa, their vultures do that job more than their buzzards. And the vulture population is declining absolutely exponentially. In India, they lost 95% of their vultures. And I'm sure you can guess the reason, and it's obviously humans. Um, we are the reason that they lost. Um, all of those vultures and unfortunately it was because what we were doing is we were giving all the cattle that we were farming and they were traveling miles walking backwards and forwards all day but if they got a bit of a sprain or a limp they wouldn't walk back and then that meant that farmer lost a bit of money so what the farmer was doing is he was putting a pain-killing drug into the water um, called diclofenac which did the job the cows were no longer limping they didn't have a problem when it came to walking around but if that uh, cow died out in the middle of nowhere, the farmer wouldn't be able to go and pick it up. He couldn't nip in his dumper truck and go and pick it up because they don't have them. If the cows can't walk, they don't go anywhere. And so that cow died, the vultures came down, clean it up as they would, it's perfectly their job, they are the clean up crew, but it will kill every single vulture that eats from that carcass. And it will kill them within about 12 hours. And so there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. All your vultures are going to die if they come and eat that carcass. Um, so luckily, um, that has now been banned for use over in India. And a couple of years ago, they, they said, do you know what would be a really good idea in Spain is to put diclofenac in the water for the cattle. And so we all so decided to say it was a little silly idea because 90% of European vultures fly through Spain every year. So it wouldn't be a very good idea. Um, and the only reason we actually started paying attention was because people started to suffer. We lost all these vultures, but we didn't really notice until people started dying. And the reason people started dying is because where you've got an ecosystem, everything is balanced. Just because birds of prey eat things, that doesn't mean they are decimating the wildlife. If Lester here caught a rabbit, that rabbit would last him four or five days. He's not going to eat one every day. So, there is a balance to the world. And with these vultures, they were no longer clearing up the carcasses, so something else was clearing up them instead. And out in India, that happened to be wild dogs. 
And unfortunately, wild dogs spread rabies. And so humans out in India are getting quite a lot of rabies. So as soon as we noticed that, we started doing something about it. But it was sort of almost too late, really, for the vultures to recover easily. And so there's lots of programs going on out there to try and restore the vulture population. Um, there is an alliance called Save, Save Ages Vultures from Extinction. Um, you can check them out on the internet, they're doing very, very good work. And a lot of their work is based over here as well, where we've got quite a lot of breeding experts, which is absolutely fantastic. So I'll do a couple more with Lester. He's very not keen on flying um, with that to, to his back, which is fair enough. It does look a little scary. But we'll do another two flights, and then I'll pick up something a little bit more energetic on this guy. Right over here. Right over there. To you and me, Lester here has been flying around the arena, he's been getting a bit of exercise, but to Lester, this is hunting. This is Lester's only opportunity today, or at least he thinks it might be his only opportunity today, to get some food, and so he will treat it like a life and death scenario. Now normally, he'd be a bit more energetic than this, he's obviously not keen on the uh, fairground rides, but that's fine. Um, and so, what we would normally do at the end of a hunting session is he would catch something. And he would come down and he would catch a rabbit, a squirrel or a rat as we said, and he would eat that quite happily. The reason he's getting keen and he's actually hopefully going to do this long flight is because he knows, I'm going to stop halfway, it's because he knows I've got his dinner on my glove. And today, for dinner, Lester here has got some quail. There we go, you get a little bit of a view. So he's got some quail, and we try and give them a nice natural diet and as varied a diet as possible. And although he wouldn't normally catch a bird in the air, he'd definitely come down and get one off the road if you happen to have squashed it accidentally. And just so you can see him a bit closer, have a little wander around the arena whilst we get the next bird ready. So he's going to eat absolutely everything on there. Fur, feather, bone, beaks, toenails and eyeballs are all going to go down in one go. And then everything he can't digest is going to come up tomorrow morning. So all of the fur, all of the feather, that's going to come up in a pellet. A lot of people know that owls produce pellets, but almost any bird out there will if they eat enough uh, sort of indigestible material. Enough fibre that they can't digest. Even pheasants and crows will bring up seed casings and beetle casings if they can't digest. Them. So that's going to come up tomorrow morning, and just to give you everybody out there um, a little bit of an idea of how pleasant it is, if we were to bring one up with the same sort of scale, with all of the fibre and the roughage we eat, it would be about the size of a watermelon coming up every morning before breakfast. So quite unpleasant, I think. Um, not particularly the most enjoyable experience, but it is part of their daily life. It's something they have to go through all the time. And you can see... He's keeping his head down, he's tucking away into that quail. And for anybody that is close enough to hear all the snapping and crunching, this is one reason we don't stroke the birds. Because his beak is very powerful, he can very easily crunch a bone. Um, and your fingers look an awful lot like worms. And he would more than happily eat worms. The other reason we don't stroke them is because it's very, very damaging for their feathers. Their feathers are quite um, fragile and they spend a lot of their day making them sort of water resistant. They have a little preen gland at the base of their tail and they are able to put that oil on all, almost all of their feathers and that makes them a little water resistant. But if he's out flying and it suddenly starts raining, he's not going to think to himself, oh, do you know what? I was stroked all day today. I best go and sit back in that marquee because I'm not going to be waterproof. What he's going to think is, well, I'm a bird when it rains, I sit in a tree. And he's going to sit there and he's going to wait till it stops raining. Unfortunately, he's not waterproof. He's going to get hypothermia, frostbite, or die. And so we don't stroke them. And you can really tell a bird that has been stroked because the water just soaks into all of their feathers. And it's not particularly very great. Very impressive, isn't it? Wonderful, wonderful wings. Everybody eats like this, I presume. Most, most of the children out there. All right, so we'll get him out of the way.